Ubisoft is one of the biggest game publishers in the entire world, and they didn't get there by not being greedy. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 of the worst Ubisoft cash grabs. At number 10 is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, supposed time savers. Here's one of Ubisoft's most infamous cash grabs, and one that earned them quite a bit of negative attention, the time savers in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The weird thing about this is that Odyssey is a good game. It's absolutely massive, and it is not short on content, but that was apparently not enough for Ubisoft. The main complaints here was that the middle portion of the game was intentionally stretched out to drive players to buy these time savers. These are microtransactions that do things like permanently increase the amount of experience you get, or let you get more resources when you collect them, stuff like that. This wasn't the first Assassin's Creed game to include time savers either, but for all the previous games, most players felt like it was never necessary to use them. However, this game made it necessary. From our personal experience, it definitely felt like there was a gap in content at a certain point in the game, where you run out of main quests and get stuck grinding out side quests to level up enough to continue with the main story. Hopefully they fixed this since release, but I actually don't know for certain. Enough players have experienced that slow middle part because there was a lot of accusations of cash grabbing, pointing at Ubisoft over this. Many felt they were intentionally dragging out the game so players would be more inclined to get time savers so they could continue the story. It's not something that has been absolutely proven, but it was a big enough issue that the narrative certainly gained a lot of traction. And let's just be clear, if it was an accident, that was still the effect. And you know what? It probably wasn't an accident. Time savers on their own just plain suck. These should not be paid features. And if developers developers feel like these features need to be available for players, they should just be free, like cheat codes. You know, old nice free cheat codes? But let's be clear, it's probably not the developers, it's probably the publishers trying to force the developers to make it easier for them to make money. At number 9 is Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which is real cash for attachments. So at launch, Ghost Recon Breakpoint was savaged by critics for just being a totally microtransaction filled mess. And it was for good reason. And it still is, to be frank. The microtransactions never really went away. This game is kind of a mess of systems and menus and all kinds of crap, but at least the developers continue to support it and it's a lot less buggy than it was. It plays a lot better now than at release, at least. Even for what players normally expected of a Ubisoft game at this point. However, this game has a lot of microtransactions. Hell, just before launch, it was going to have time savers like the Assassin's Creed games, but player anger got them to actually pull them, claiming that they were up by mistake. Of course, they did eventually sneak them back in. No surprise there. Have you not seen how the video game industry works? Or hell, all industry? So just about everything in Breakpoint has a price, and probably the most useless of them are the attachments. Yeah, these things you can put on weapons like scopes, extended magazines, and underbarrel attachments, you have to buy all of them. You can find them in the game, you don't have to buy them at all, but even still they come at a steep price. If you buy them directly off the in-game store, they mostly go for about 350 ghost credits. Want to know how much 5 bucks worth of these credits are? 600. So for 5 bucks you can buy exactly one of the attachments in the store. If you want another, you'll have to throw down for another fiver. All for things you can get in-game and honestly aren't that hard to find. They could have at least made these things pretty cheap, but no, instead they nickel and dime you. The fact that you could just buy every weapon in the game is bad enough, but they're even asking you to pay for attachments, and that's ridiculous. At number 8 is Rainbow Six Siege's Premium Outbreak Pack. This game had a limited time mode that ran from March 6th to April 3rd, 2018 called Outbreak. Basically, it was Left for Dead in Rainbow Six Siege. You fought through semi-linear areas separated by safe houses, and the whole thing was basically the inspiration for the next Rainbow Six game, right now called Quarantine, but that'll probably change for obvious reason. This mode introduced something called Premium Alpha Packs, which were basically loot boxes that would contain one random item that's some unique outbreak thing. They made 50 exclusive items for this thing, and though they were all cosmetic, the fact that there was no way to earn all these items just by playing the mode rubbed players the wrong way. Here is the sticking point. Ubisoft gave players four of the exclusive outbreak packs. Each one of these packs contains exactly one item, and that is it. Not really much of a pack, is it? 
So if you wanted to get all the exclusive cosmetics, which remember, were only available for the duration of the event, which only ran for two months, you would have to buy 46 additional packs. There was no other way to earn these things in game through grinding or anything like that. Only players who bought the advanced edition of Rainbow Six Siege got more packs. They got 10, so they would still need to buy 36 packs if they wanted all this stuff. So pretty much if you wanted all the cosmetic content, you'd have to spend at minimum a little over 100 bucks. The one saving grace of this thing is that you'd never get a duplicate item from each pack, so it was at least possible to get all of the items. But the worst thing about it is that Rainbow Six Siege is still doing these limited time alpha packs, but at least they're usually fewer items and sometimes they give you a way to get a few more packs at a time. It's barely an improvement, but it's something. At number 7 is Far Cry New Dawn's credits. Coming out just a year after Far Cry 5, New Dawn works as a kind of sequel to that game that takes place in the post-apocalyptic future. But just because the world is destroyed doesn't mean you don't get microtransactions. Oh no no, whatever happened to the dollar doesn't matter, you're still spending them. Unlike Far Cry 5, the game introduces a weird kind of tiered level system, where enemies will take less damage and do more damage if they're a higher level than you are. It, it basically turns this FPS series into kind of an RPG thing. That on its own really wouldn't be a big deal in any way. It's a strange turn, but eh, it's kind of a strange game as far as the series go. Side game as well. So a little experimentation from the devs is hardly a problem. What is a problem is that the new progression system really feels like a way for Ubisoft to sneak in some more microtransactions in the way of credits that you can use to boost your progression. With these credits, you can unlock weapons that are higher tier than what you have, and you can buy crafting supplies to build up facilities at the main base without having to hunt around for them. Basically, they're shortcuts. Sure, you can also buy some cosmetic stuff with them, but these credits can be found in the open world, and there's something kind of blatantly predatory about inserting all these new systems into the game, RPG mechanics, base building, etc, etc. Expanded crafting, ooh, in a series that just didn't have anything like that before, just so they can put some microtransactions in the game. And number six is the premium vendor from The Division. Before the release, The Division's developers promised there wouldn't be any DLC in the game, and they stuck to that promise for about a year. With update 1.6, they added the premium vendor into the game, and players were not happy. Now, the thing that irked players wasn't really the microtransactions exactly. It's the fact that they were inserted in the game world and annoyingly priced, which made a lot of the cosmetic items players used to expect to get for free or find in the game world, they were sold for money. This is a fairly early example of this era of Ubisoft's cash grabbing, and in the grand scheme, isn't nearly as bad as some of the other stunts they've tried to pull since. But stuff like this shows that Ubisoft was taking their first steps toward their current policy of just jamming as many microtransactions as they can into pretty much all of their game. At number 5 is Trials Rising, the Scarab Bike. The Trials series is a ton of fun. It's all about racing a bike through these imaginative and challenging levels to score the best time with the fewest faults or crashes. It's about as old school as it gets in terms of difficulty, and it has this small but really rabid fan base. Trials Rising was not the first game in the series to incorporate more quote-unquote modern game design trends, but it was definitely the worst about it. Always online requirements, tedious grinding, dumb multiplayer integration were just a few things things fans of the series complained about with Ryzen. Those are all bad enough, but one thing that I really just can't get over is the fact that they started including paid bikes. Now normally in a Trials game, you unlock increasingly more technical bikes as you play through the game, with easy to control bikes first, and then you gain access to more complex bikes that allow you to perform some of the more difficult stunts that later courses require. What makes these games so fun is that pretty much everyone is on the same playing field, but with Rising, that is all thrown out of whack. Now there are bikes that you can simply buy, some of which cannot even be earned normally. Probably the most necessary of these is the Scarab, a bike that can get players a better time on certain tracks. Yes, if you want to get the best times, then you pretty much need to buy this bike, making it a total pay to win thing. A lot of other bikes are a little more goofy or just flat out gimmicks, but the fact that any of them can outperform a bike you would normally get really sucks. Like, it's just a total cash grab in a series you didn't really expect to see that in. And number four is Immortals Phoenix Rising, the Adventure Time Character Pack. Now this is just a dumb one, but have you seen this character pack? That is all it is, just a cosmetic piece of DLC, but it's it's also ugly, like ugly as hell. And not just in a, oh, I don't like the aesthetics of this costume kind of ugly. I actually like Adventure Time. What I mean is it's kind of in the legitimately creepy looking territory. Honestly, in that regard, it's also kind of amazing. The more I look at the Jake slash bird thing, the more freaky I find it, and the unicorn 
Unicorn Horse just does not look much better at all. There's just something really unpleasant about this costume. It's not the worst thing on this list by far, but it's definitely the creepiest and probably the most hilarious due to that. And number three is Prince of Persia's Epilogue DLC. Now, if you ever played it, you probably remember that the 2008 Prince of Persia reboot game for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 ended on a cliffhanger and a pretty big one at that. Almost a year later, Ubisoft came out with this DLC called the Epilogue, which basically functioned as an ending for the game. Many players immediately called foul on this, saying that this DLC was pretty much making players pay to experience the ending of the game. Game. I said that with a lot of intent, if you noticed. In reality, I mean, this wasn't exactly the case. Sure, this DLC takes place after the ending and adds some context to what happens, but it really ends up feeling more like a setup for the eventual sequel than a true ending of the game. Of course, it's now also been more than 10 years since this came out, and there's no sequel in sight, so at the moment, it's actually the end of the series. This point is kind of a good example of how the goalposts have shifted regarding cash grabs. Back when this came out, a three-hour expansion DLC was considered a cash grab and these days that's practically nothing so as far as the worst it's absolutely not but notable nonetheless and number two is Assassin's Creed Unity's temporary boosts. Now, microtransactions in the Assassin's Creed series are pretty much expected at this point, but it was not always the case. Ubisoft held off on inserting any of these real money systems into their games until about 2012, with Assassin's Creed Black Flag and its Helix credits. I mean, they did it in other games at that point, so I'm not exactly praising their restraint, but even though the move was met with a lot of anger from players at the time, Ubisoft stuck to their guns, and we're still seeing these Helix credits show up in the Assassin's Creed games now. Now. Like these things are bad enough, but probably the worst and most pointless thing you could buy with these credits was these temporary boosts that would increase your total health, melee, and even make you harder to see for a short period of time. Like, do I even need to get into how lame that is? These temporary boosts are some, something like out of a mobile game. Definitely not AAA experience type stuff. And the fact that you can find them in game doesn't really take away from that. Time savers are bad enough, but these things, they're time savers on a timer or short term changes cheat codes that cost real money. Unity is kind of a massive a game, like do you really need to add in confusing microtransactions on top of it? Well it's Ubisoft, so yes, yes they do, of course, why wouldn't they? And finally, at number one, For Honor's Griffin Hero. Now, this is a nasty one we dug up. For Honor has a pretty decent amount of microtransactions, DLC, and expansions at this point, but none were really as bad as this guy. Why? Because players were buying the Griffin Hero, but they weren't actually getting the Griffin Hero. That's pretty much the ultimate cash grab, getting players to spend money and giving them nothing. Combine that with Ubisoft's famously terrible customer support, you got a lot of players who were not able to play as the hero they paid for. This mostly seemed to be an issue on the Steam version of For Honor, buying it off the Steam store would for some reason not register with Ubisoft's Unity app, which by the way is still a major problem. Buying Ubisoft games off Steam is still filled with problems, and they seem unable or just unwilling to fix this stuff. I mean, this is one bug that they did manage to squash at some point, but we can't help but laugh at this one. It's a microtransaction that's not bad necessarily because it's exploitative or too expensive or wasteful. It's bad because a lot of people just didn't get get anything after they paid for it. That's taking cash grabbing to the next level, even if accidentally. That is all for today. I am sure you have stories and thoughts on this, so leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to click the notification bell. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I am Falcon. Follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Gamranks.